I have to admit that I don't usually pay attention to the Jazzmaster line from Hamilton. It's for the most part falling into the category of some of the other watches that Hamilton make. Now, don't get me wrong, I like Hamilton, and like many people, I have a soft spot for both the Murph and their classic cocky field watches. This time though, the Jazzmaster caught my attention, and mainly because of the reactions I noted out on the World Wide Web. The problem was, of course, that many felt it looked way too much like a Rolex Daytona. It didn't have the ceramic bezel like the Zenith Chronomaster Sport, but in many ways, well, yes, it does remind you of the Daytona. The two questions that then come up are, is it an homage, inadvertent or not? Does it stand on its own merits? Let's take a look. Right off the bat, we're talking about a $2,250 watch, which is a fair bit cheaper than a Daytona. This is a 42 millimeter watch versus the Daytona's 40 millimeters. It has a 22 millimeter lug width and a 60 hour power reserve coming from the H31 movement, which is a Hamilton modified version of a Valjoux 7753 movement, I think. Also, it's 15.22 millimeters thick, which is panorama thick. It has a date window at the 4.30 position, which the Daytona doesn't. This is a very reasonably priced watch, and it is what I would happily call good value. Hamilton makes good watches for the price, and although not having worn it for months on end, I expect it to be acceptable quality and acceptable accuracy. The reason this watch gets the Daytona homage response is obviously not because of the design of the movement. This is purely down to aesthetics and you can't get around it. This watch does initially have a passing resemblance with the Daytona. Why? Because it's a steel chronograph with tachymeter bezel and three half panda sub-registers with almost identical placement as a Daytona. Those three things alone make it initially very reminiscent of the Daytona, especially the previous 116520 with steel bezel which was in production from 2000 to 2016. But then again. I, like I assume many watch lovers, walk a fine line between enthusiast and stalker. I remember being at an Ed Sheeran concert. My seat was approximately one mile from the stage, but when Ed walked onto the stage, the first thing I heard myself saying to my wife was, he's wearing a black ceramic AP, but, but that subdial configuration, I've never seen that before, I have to check. It also happens that I can be sitting at a restaurant or just walking through a supermarket noticing a person's watch and trying to place myself strategically in you know, the flour, rice and pasta aisle to get a better look at the person's wrist to see if it really is the watch that I think it is. I remember being in a store where a younger person behind the counter initially had what I thought was a Rolex GMT Pepsi. I couldn't get close and I didn't have the nerve to ask, which I probably just should have. Was it a real Pepsi? I couldn't tell. The dial, the bezel, the bracelet were all at a distance, almost identical to the Rolex. Only when I briefly saw the clasp did I conclude that it was a dissing homage. That's how much it looked like a GMT Pepsi. The Jazzmaster doesn't do that. There's no time where I accidentally mistake this watch for a Daytona. First of all, this watch is significantly larger than a Daytona. At 42 millimeters with 22 millimeter lug width and elongated lugs and an overall large case profile, this watch wears significantly bigger than a Daytona. The Daytona is a watch that many people, even with smaller wrists, can comfortably wear. The 2023 version is more masculine and feels larger, but overall the Daytona is even not dainty, but it, it fits smaller wrists. The Jazzmaster can't and doesn't. This thing is huge on most people's wrists. Then on the black steel bezel model, you do not get the ceramic sheen you get from Cerachrome bezels. This watch is overall more matted in the case finishing, the bezel and also the dial. There are elements of polished beveling on the flanks of the Hamilton, which you will not find on the polished Daytona. The hands are sword hands versus the more basic baton hands of the Daytona. The screw down chronograph pushes of the Daytona are not copied. The Hamilton instead opts for elongated buttons that remind me of seat adjustment buttons in a Mercedes. The short stubby arm markers on the Daytona or stick or baton markers on the Hamilton. Finally, the bracelet is in no way an oyster bracelet opting, still for a three link bracelet style, but with significantly less taper and with polished beveling only on the the flanks of the center links. Short version, this does not look like a Daytona and will not be mistaken as a Daytona by anyone in the know. I would go as far as to say that you could wear it in London or Los Angeles and no one would rob you by accident. Those thieves are surprisingly and unfortunately well informed. So it's not a Daytona, but is it pretty? Eh, it's a harder question. Well, yes and no. The blue sunrail dial version with plain steel bezel is by far the version I appreciate the most. The circular race pattern on the subdials is also a nice touch, but it and the black dial model feels a little basic. It doesn't have a detailed matte black like you see in a Majitek or a quality sunray like you do on a Nomos. I also quite appreciate the chrono pusher style. 
it gives a sleek, dynamic and speedy look to it that I like and I think it works really well. I do, however, not particularly care for the bracelet and overall the watch feels very bulky because of the lack of taper. Straps are what should be worn with this watch but not NATO's because with the 15.2 millimeters adding a NATO and therefore another two or three or four millimeters underneath the case will just make it completely too huge. Personally, I'm not in the category where a watch has to be 40 millimeters or less. I wear Panerai's G-Shocks and I'm sure most people would find them oversized. This watch though has a size and presence that puts it firmly in the manly watch category. It's substantial and by no means restrained. Any larger and it would have risked getting into Michael Kors Invicta territory, which would have been a definitive bad thing. The 22 millimeter lug width magnifies the manliness for lack of a better word of this watch, but it comes with the gripe as I mentioned that the lugs and the overall case length is a lot. The dial and tacky bezel are really well proportioned, but those lugs really hurt the overall proportions of the watch. The sword hands remind me of those you often find on Seiko's like the cocktail time. And although going with pencils or batons would make it more Daytona air, I think it would have been a better proposition. Then you have a date at 4.30, which hardly ever looks good. Put all those things together and the watch feels a little bit over simple. Lots of good components let down by some very simplistic styling, a slightly cheap or basic, I think basic's the right word, not cheap, uh, visual aesthetic and proportions that are way off. It doesn't come across as a premium watch, but more a rugged and fundamentally basic interpretation of a chronograph. I would even go so far as to say bland, which begs the question, can you do better for the price? Absolutely. Get yourself a Hanhart 417 in the 42mm version or even better the 39. Forget the bun strap, which is an oddity, but you get a far more visually appealing watch. Elegant, retro, well finished and just generally a far cooler watch. This is a watch that oozes thoughtfulness, elegance and has some specialness to it. Want something with three sub-registers, a date window and a better dial in a retro aesthetic? Tissot PRX. It has its weaknesses, which I spoke of in my review of the plain PRX. But it is an attractive package for the price and definitely worth consideration. And again, for the price, it's an excellent interpretation of that 1970s aesthetic you get from watches like the Vacheron 222, the Oyster Quartzes of the 70s, and also that high-end beast, the AP Royal Oak. For a more instrumental take on a chronograph, there's the Sin 103. It's far more utilitarian and industrial, but also with more thought put into the design. Yeah, it's not for everybody's sensibilities, but that's kind of the point. The person that buys the 103, the PRX or the 417 have actively had to consider the overall aesthetic implications of their watch in the context of their wardrobe. If you want something a little bit more quirky, Breitling is there with the Top Time or the Navi Timer. These watches have far more character, far more personality than the Hamilton. Finally, if you can live without the chronograph function, consider something like the Nomus Club Sport. Yes, it's slightly more expensive, but not by much. But in terms of steel sports watches, this is a stunner compared to the Hamilton. The Hamilton isn't a perfect watch. It's definitely not a Daytona and it's not trying to be one. That's not its downfall in my mind. To me, this watch is an Olive Garden Pasta Alfredo. It's an Ikea Billy shelving system. It's basic, it's a bit generic, it's a bit bland. I think it's what ChatGPT would describe if I asked it to build me a broadly appealing middle of the road chronograph with inoffensive styling, which just isn't enough for me. There are just better options out there. Now, before you think I'm bashing Hamilton, I would suggest you take a look at the Hamilton Intramatic. Now that's a cool chrono. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, subscribe. Cheers.